Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Partner Spotlight Series brought to you by Zentegra. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, we're going to have our friends from Incentra here presenting. Um, if you're not familiar with this, these are the moments when we allow our partners to spotlight solutions or um, particular topics, and this is all about the ideology of enablement and building our community between our partners and our customers, but you know, basically like I call, everybody is a partner uh, as far as how Zintegra interacts and works within the ecosystem that we have built. So we'll start digging into this. Uh, first off, I wanna bring up uh, some things that we have going on. I work has no boundaries, which is the Bronco giveaway. You can go to the website there. Um, also down below, you can see the QR code. That QR code will take you to the URL. Uh, to be able to enter in uh, for the raffle to win a brand new Bronco. Um, you will also be able to, uh, you'll need to like follow up. You'll see our partners we work with or in Centra for more details and more information to be able to qualify your entry into the raffle. With today's webinar, we have a giveaway, uh, Amazon gift card that will be awarded after. Um, so you will be notified who our winner is. Um, so make sure you're interactive, make sure you're being a, a good participant within the environment. Uh, everything helps, but this way, you know, things are more information sharing within the webinar. And then, like I said, somebody from Incentral will follow up with you post webinar on the winner of the gift card. So first off, what I'm going to do is jump into who's Integra is. If this is your first time here. Um, you're going to get some wealth of knowledge about us. If you've been here before, well, a little bit of repetition, but I like to change words up so you'll see things a little bit different. So from a Zentegra standpoint, we are a reseller. Uh, we provide services and we also provide solutions as well as hosting solutions. So we were founded on the ideology, like I said, creating a community, building this ecosystem of solutions, of technologies, uh, with workspaces, with users, with customers, to be able to provide the most sound solution to meet your business needs. Andy Whiteside is the founder of the company. Um, he came from Citrix, where he saw that there was a lack of a community, a lack of this enablement to be able to provide these details and this information throughout uh, the environment. You know, most vendors were out there, hey, we're just going to sell you a solution and that's it. Uh, where we at Zentegra take the approach of we're helping you find a solution, we're helping you evaluate, review other technologies as they come along, and give you our feedback and input. We're here as an alliance to be partners with you to be able to help you focus on those business strategies that you have come up and find the proper solutions for your users. Like I said, we're a value-added reseller. Uh, we have consulting services, and we also have managed services as well as complementary assessments, which is our micro assessments. And uh, you'll see that information also on our webpage, as well as on the, uh, using the QR code going to the uh, drawing, you'll be able to go there. And if you schedule a micro assessment, that helps as well. Uh, you'll see the different types that we offer as far as solutions are concerned. Our, our core partners out there that we work with, Citrix, VMware, Microsoft, Nutanix, ServiceNow, iGel, and AWS. Like I said, our main focus is a digital workspace data transformation to be able to help you uh, virtualize those environments and provide a more secure and definable solution. So myself, John Splone, thanks for attending everybody. Um, I'm an old guy, I've been here a little over two years within Zintegra. However, I've been in the industry for 26 plus years. Uh, I've done everything that you can think of. I've done it all from consultant, uh, architecture, engineering, uh, all the way down to a sysadmin. So all across the board. Most recently, I came from Citrix, where I worked there for seven plus years on the technical enablement team for the worldwide, uh, where I handled uh, technical education and enablement for Citrix's internal resources, for customers as well as for partners as it related to EUC and Citrix solutions within the cloud. I also did a stint within 
uh, Cloud Jumper, who is now over uh, in NetApp providing um, solutions for EUC, which is um, out there. Cloud Jumper, another one is Nerdio, um, who provides EUC within an Azure enclosure. Um, so as far as it's concerned, I know a lot. I've been in the industry for a long time. Uh, I'm a solutions architect for Zentegra as well as our public cloud alliance lead. So I handle our partnerships with our public cloud providers, Azure, AWS, Google, um, with a core focus around AWS, where we work within the EUC solutions, as well as core infrastructure. Uh, tons of dad jokes. I'm not going to get into one right now. Um, well, maybe I will. Okay, what do you get when you cross a uh, cow and a sheep? You get two animals in a bad mood. Okay. So now that that's out of the way, um, the other thing I possess is a Zen-like balance between my work life and my nerdery, uh, geekery, everything from you name it, comic books, collectibles, all of it. Uh, so I'm pretty big in that as well. Uh, like I said, we've got in Centra with us today. Johnny's here. Uh, Johnny, if you want to jump on real quick. There Hello. he is. <laughs> So, Johnny, you're going to go ahead and take over here. What I'm going to do is, is stop sharing my screen. Uh, okay, now you can take control. Uh, and then also, real quick, before Johnny starts, I want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, enter them in the Q&A section. That way we could track them and be able to provide you the right answers uh, as soon as possible. With that, I give you Johnny from Incentra, and thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. What a lovely handover. What a lovely guy. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Johnny. Uh, I am from Incentra, and I'm here as part of the Partner Spotlight webinar with Zentegra. So, um, who am I? My name, as I said, my name is Johnny Murray. I'm the Azure Practice Lead at uh, at Incentra. Uh, I also have a large amount of experience in the industry. I think uh, just coming up on 27 years now. Um, have five kids, so we've both got kids. We've both been in the industry a while. Uh, my background is is really since the inception of Active Directory back in the uh, very last month of 1999. I've worked with uh, all sorts of migrations from NT to Active Directory, Exchange to Office 365, all various versions of Exchange. I've worked with uh, um, divestitures and migration migrations uh, between all sorts of different elements, and some really weird and wonderful things in between. Uh, more recently, I've been concentrating on uh, working with Microsoft and Azure, holding a very senior position in the UK with uh, with Microsoft uh, in the Azure space, in the retail infrastructure space, and uh, also working with some large UK resellers and partners in the UK uh, around setting up their Azure infrastructure and uh, Azure environments, uh, very similar to the, the practice lead position that I'm running now at Incentra. So that's what I bring with me. Uh, I too am also a geek, hugely, hugely into geekism. Um, I have a whole fleet of different American cars in various states of uh, disrepair. And I have a, a YouTube channel where I build and mostly crash drones. So um, getting very good at crashing them. Anyway, that's a little bit about me. Today's topic is Azure Arc. So what we're going to do is run through a few slides. And I really hope this will not be death by PowerPoint. That is not the design here at all. What I'd like to do is, get things sort of this end, is if you pop any questions you have in the chat, um, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll cover off those questions at the end. So for now, um, we'll rattle through, get my chat open as well so I can see that. We'll rattle through the slides, and um, we'll, we'll try and uncover some, some interesting stuff around Azure Arc. Okay, so first thing, what is Azure Arc? Uh, well, Microsoft Azure uh, Arc is a solution that offers centralized management of all resources in on-premise edge and multi-cloud scenarios. And uh, the Azure Resource Catalog, ARC, uh, services were developed with the express purpose of integrating non-Azure resources with Azure. So think about that for a moment. This is integrating non-Azure resources with Azure. And what does that really mean? Well, it means that, um, if you, uh, most of you guys have a, an environment at the moment that you are looking after or are involved with, you may have a, a plane to look at your Active Directory services. You may have a monitoring system for that or a window into that environment. You may have some kind of cloud services, uh, Google Cloud or AWS or Azure, and you have a different interface to look into that environment. 
You may have an edge environment with Internet of Things, potentially Azure Stack, rare, but still potentially Azure Stack. And maybe that edge environment has a different plane that you look into. And then there's your on-premise environment uh, in the way of applications and, and other elements that are, again, in, in a different plane of existence for you to look at a different screen. Well, what Arc does is it takes all of these elements and it gives you a single plane, a single point of view uh, against all of these things. Now, Microsoft has been steadily enhancing Azure's control plane, which is responsible for controlling the, the lifespan of resources, such as virtual machines, database instances, um, Hadoop clusters and Kubernetes clusters uh, since its launch about a decade ago. Uh, the Azure Fabric, uh, Fabric Controller uh, is the technical name for the control plane. So the, the Fabric Controller is, is consulted whenever a resource such as a VM is provided and scaled, stopped or terminated. Azure Arc has a control plane extension. Microsoft has, has extended um, ARM support to resources running outside of Azure via Azure Arc. And that means that a physical server in a data center appears to the fabric controller as a compute resource. So virtual machines operating on VMware and vSphere, Amazon EC2 and Google Compute Engine can all be registered with Azure Resource Manager. Um, any Windows or Linux server, including those behind a firewall or proxy, can also be registered with ARM. Uh, the external VMs execute software that is identical to an agent that runs within Azure VMs. So in addition to VMs, Azure Arc may register Kubernetes clusters. Uh, once installed, any Kubernetes cluster can be managed in the same way that Azure's own Kubernetes service, AKS, is. And this means that pivotal Kubernetes service cluster running on vSphere in the data center, as well as the popular managed Kubernetes service such as Amazon EKS, for example, or Google Kubernetes Engine and IBM Kubernetes Service even, can be also registered with Azure Arc. And what's more, Azure Arc can host a managed database service in hybrid and multi-cloud scenarios, which is intriguing. Uh, two databases like uh, Azure SQL Database and Postgres, um, Postgres SQL, for example, uh, hyperscale uh, are currently uh, available for use outside of Azure. So some of the key advantages of managed databases, such as automated updates, patching, security audits, and no touch upgrades are extended to Azure data services. It encompasses everything within that uh, one plane, that, that singular bubble. Finally, customers can deploy modern cloud native applications packaged as microservices to Azure Arc VMs or Kubernetes clusters. Application services benefit from recent investments in open source initiatives like Reader and Dapper, which we've seen in the news recently. In summary, Microsoft is enabling Azure to manage the following externally deployed services. And they include Windows and Linux servers in bare metal, virtual machines, and public cloud IaaS Kubernetes clusters. But why should you care about data services based on SQL, Azure, and PostgreSQL, hyperscale applications packaged and distributed as microservices operating on Kubernetes Azure Arc? Well, it's a good question. You should care because it's that single pane. It allows you to take anything from any environment that you can have in multi-cloud, on-premise, and edge, as we can see within that particular slide, and view them from a single plane. It allows you to deploy those agents to gather metrics and monitor uh, all of these elements from that single plane. A control center, if you like, um, a bridge of the Starship Enterprise, something similar to that. Many different stations, but with one view across them all. So what exactly does this mean for customers? Um, looking at the slide, we have Azure Arc and the single control plane with Azure Arc. And just below, we can see it clearly says, bring Azure services to any infrastructure. Just across from that, we can see that it says modernize data centers with Azure Stack. So Azure Stack can be included in this, which we'll go into shortly. And the third element there is extend to the edge with Azure IoT, the Internet of Things. Very useful. Um, IoT is, a, is a, something that I play around with a lot recently, um, especially even in my spare time, uh, developing um, devices that interface with solar infrastructure for charging my various bits of geekery inside the house. So what exactly does this mean for customers? What are the advantages of Azure Arc for businesses? I'll try and respond to that. So customers may manage resources deployed within and outside of Azure using the same control plane with Azure Arc. They can use the automation features provided by ARM templates and the Azure API. So 
One ARM template, for example, can deploy a set of public facing virtual machines in Azure, while also providing VMs in the data center that run legacy databases. It enables the, the application of RBAC, uh, tagging and identification policies uh, to resources. So enterprises can then utilize the Azure Security Center to verify the compliance of all Azure Arc registered resources, regardless of where they're deployed. When a vulnerability is discovered, they can swiftly patch the operating systems running in VMs, and customers can encrypt file systems across all VMs with a single click. Just think about that for a moment. With a single click, you can encrypt all of the file systems across all VMs. And that's really prevalent, especially in today's environment and scenario where we're seeing an awful lot of cyber issues, cyber threats, and certainly a lot of encryption, malware, uh, and cryptoware. So policy, policies may be defined once and automatically applied to all Azure data center and even VMs running on other cloud platforms resources. So that means if you have boxes running on-prem in AWS, in Google, in Azure, the policy that you can define can then be deployed to all of those regardless of, uh, of the location, giving you true flex and power in a single click. So all of Azure Arc registered resources submit logs to a centralized cloud-based Azure monitor. So it's an extremely effective method for gaining insights from highly distributed and fragmented infrastructure setups. And finally, the Azure Automation, Automation Service uh, may be used to handle routine to complex maintenance tasks across public, hybrid, and multi-cloud settings. So customers of Azure Arc can utilize the Azure portal, Azure CLI, SDK, and the third-party tools such as Terraform uh, and Ansible. We've all, all come across those in our, in our travels to automate uh, resource management in the same way that public cloud resources are managed. In short, the Azure Arc really is a, a game changer. It enables organizations with older infrastructure to join the hybrid cloud bandwagon. bandwagon. A physical x86 server running on a decade old version of Oracle and Linux can simply register with Azure Arc and appear in the Azure portal with the same resource group and region as a modern elastic web application that communicates with the, uh, the ancient database. You can truly have that flex across those, those environments, old and new. So that horrible cranky server that you've had bashing along underneath somebody's desk for the past four years that nobody really knows what it does. And when somebody is brave enough to lift the covers and see what's inside that thing, and it's not possible to migrate it to Azure for one reason or the other, you don't need to worry about it. You can extend Azure Arc services out to that box and encompass it, bring it along, make it appear as if it were within Azure. So Microsoft isn't abandoning customers who use legacy hardware and virtual machines in the hybrid cloud. In the world of Azure Arc, the VMs are treated as first class citizens. So, uh, Azure Arc makes it simple to execute greenfield programs bundled and deployed as containers using AKS and Kubernetes, the two super hot words of the last three years, I would say. Uh, Microsoft and Alibaba jointly announced the open application model specification, which simplifies modeling microservices built on numerous containers, Ruda and OEM implementation. It will serve as an ab abstraction layer uh, for Kubernetes infrastructure. We first saw that, in fact, when, this is when I was at Microsoft going back about four years ago, first saw the, the elements of Ruda and OEM implementation where um, there was a whole bunch of Raspberry Pis all plumbed in together, uh, an x86 box, an x64 box, uh, even an old mobile phone. They were all brought in as nodes on a Kubernetes cluster, whilst microservices were failed around each of these systems. And little did we know, but at the time, this really was the, the beginnings of uh, this very system. So with, Azure's Arc, with Azure Arc support for VMs and Kubernetes, Microsoft will simplify application modernization and digital transformation without sacrificing much. And Microsoft is also among the first to offer managed data services in the hybrid cloud because these database services are packaged as containers and run on top of Kubernetes. Uh, they can be managed from the centralized Azure control plane. Azure Arc will serve the same uh, overarching administration layer from the recently announced hybrid cloud products, which include Azure Stack Hub, Azure Stack HCI, and I've got to make sure I get this right, Azure Stack Edge as well. Uh, they can uh, execute one or more supported Azure services through Azure Arc, depending on their footprint and capability. So Microsoft Azure Arc and Azure Stack portfolios demonstrate a successful blend of hardware and software strategies. I think that's really keen to bear in mind. This isn't a second or a third attempt uh, necessarily for Microsoft at uh, Azure Stack. 
it's more of the realization of Azure Stack um, growing and maturing into, I think, what it should have been, and at least what it was destined to be. The next slides are a little bit uh, less daunting, and I realize that's an awful lot of information to take on board. But before we delve into this, this next slide, um, let's just reflect on a few of those points that we've spoken about. Arc is giving us the opportunity here then to have a single plane, and that really is the core of Azure Arc against all of our services, whether they be Kubernetes, uh, on-prem devices, Google-based devices, AWS-based devices, databases within Azure, uh, not within Azure. It doesn't matter. We can have these policies set and configured with a one-click deploy. What it also allows us to do is bring that presence into Azure so that it can be seen. Moving on to this slide, the Arc Data Services, Azure Arc enabled data services architecture. And here we can see a lovely um, picture that was taken from Microsoft uh, around the container registry and how this is all built up. This shows you the flow of uh, information between the Azure portal and the CLI, how the Kubernetes CLI integrates with the Azure Data Studio, and how that then integrates with the Azure Arc integration for the resource inventory billing, logs, metrics, and backup retention information and control. So the settings of the customers have grown more complicated over the last few years, that's true. Um, single data centers give way to many data centers and more recently to hybrid and multi-cloud systems. That's becoming ever more clear. The difficulty of viewing and managing the resources that dispersed over several data centers and even different clouds increases as complexity climbs. It's highly difficult for administrators who maintain these resources across these numerous deployment targets to do. Um, to do. I mean, it is, it's just difficult, isn't it? So they frequently use different tools, deployment strategies, orchestration approaches and management techniques. And I'm guilty of the same. Uh, in some cases, you get confused. You know, do you have to go into a specific location to change a metric for a policy? Where on earth is the, the data retention policy for this particular um, secure data? It, it's all spread all over the place. And it gets even worse if you have multiple data centers, uh, a little server room on-prem and Azure, and perhaps some other bits in dev for AWS. It becomes almost impossible to manage. And this is looking to constrain all that, to bring it into a central location. So numerous customers are also unable to migrate to the cloud for a variety of reasons, including data sovereignty. That's a big one, where your data exists and the local government laws and rules around that data. Data compliance, very important for financial and investment companies, but also investments that they've made in their own data centers as well and how that can relate. Because if you spent a whole bunch of money um, specializing in data sovereignty and compliance in your data center, why on earth would you strip out those policies to bring them into Azure to only have to recreate them when you could lift them uh, or leave them where they are and leave those policies intact, but simply have the, the view of that environment as a centralized locale instead. Right, so I'm getting over a cold. It's been a couple of days, but it still gets in the way. Okay, so uh, platform as a service. Let's hop into that quickly. So the, the, the PaaS services from Azure are brought uh, into your own infrastructure as well, you know, whether that may be in your own data centers or in edge locations, like retail outlets or factories or in a public cloud. Um, Azure Arc data services uh, are similar to PaaS options within Azure. Um, so it will give you a, a single point of control for managing all of these different resources, regardless of where they're located. Um, the Azure Arc enabled data services uh, give you the ability to use Kubernetes to, uh, to execute your uh, Azure services locally at the edge and on public cloud. So again, bringing all of those environments into a, into a single, single plane. What we'll do is we'll, we'll skip on to the next piece, which uh, sits around Azure Stack and Arc. And this touches on the parts um, that we've covered off and some of it, it gives you a visual layout of, of the interactions and the stack separations. Um, if you remember, like I said earlier, with Azure Stack, it's been various things over the year, whether it be a bit of hardware that was provided by Microsoft with Windows Core. If everyone remembers the server core that used to run on these things, um, highly locked down. It was basically Azure in a box without all of the, uh, the big data and the computational and AI infrastructures. It's changed a bit. Uh, it got pushed out towards an IoT, 
uh, style device. Then it got pushed out to almost a branch cache style device. Uh, and then third party hardware vendors were brought in uh, to basically promote these devices, pr promote offers against the hardware and uh, Azure stack uh, into what it is really today. So we now still have the, the offerings from the likes of HP and Dell uh, providing these Azure stack um, hubs and they're now fully integrated um, and correctly, I'll say integrated using Azure stack and Arc. So Microsoft offers solutions to create your own private on-premise cloud with Azure Stack and Arc. For those businesses who can't yet migrate to the cloud, have certain workloads they can't migrate to the cloud or have a restricted to no internet connectivity, and that is key. Um, in this webinar, I'll concentrate on how you can host your data by databases using these tools. So in addition to uh, Azure called Azure Stack, um, three ways to deploy Azure services while running apps and databases on-premise. First one is run your own private independent cloud or um, connected or unconnected, in fact, uh, with cloud native apps and dependable Azure services on premise with Azure Stack Hub. So racks of four to 16 servers or thereabouts are made up of Azure Stack Hub integrated systems are assembled by reliable hardware partners and supplied right to your data centers. Uh, the same tools that you'd use to manage your Azure subscriptions are also used to operate Azure Stack Hub which is built on industry standard hardware. So as a result, whether you're lin linked into Azure or not, you may use identical DevOps procedures. You can deliver Azure services to off the grid places with spotty internet access uh, using the Azure Stack Hub architecture. So it really gives you that flexibility to bring Azure into places where there is little to no connection. A bit like when I chose to move into the countryside and had to use Starlink and then swiftly realized I needed 4G LTE to keep things smooth. And this offers a similar experience. It brings that, uh, that Azure plane into that um, partially offline uh, data center. So additionally, you can develop uh, hybrid solutions that first aggregate data in Azure for further processing and analytics after it's been processed locally in Azure Stack Hub. Uh, finally, because Azure Stack Hub is set up on-premise, you have the flexibility to deploy cloud apps on-premise without changing any code, allowing you to satisfy particular regulatory or policy requirements. And again, there's some really interesting information in that last statement. Uh, the fact that your one of the limitations around Azure Stack was the fact, uh, as we mentioned earlier, there is a lack of AI, big data and processing because you don't have that amount of compute power in Azure Stack. It is a, a very small bump on the edge of a very large bubble. But by having this uh, offloading of, of processing and analytics, you can actually offload into Azure process and bring the results back into Stack. So Azure Stack uh, for your Internet of Things and AI workloads, um, you can get quick insights with Azure Managed Appliance using computing and hardware accelerated machine learning. And um, that's the way that it works, it offloads. And consider it as a much more compact variation of the Azure Stack Hub that uh, makes use of the hardware as a service product, like, um, like the Pro GPO, uh, Pro FPGA, I believe, the Pro R and the Mini R. Uh, the Mini R is built to function in um, really odd and extreme environmental circumstances, um, supporting uses in tactical edge, humanitarian aid, emergency response, and so on. So there's some really cool use case scenarios for that as well, and well worth a look. Moving onwards, the hyper-converged infrastructure, so HCI, HCI cluster solution, um, Azure Stack HCI, which is currently in preview. Um, the platform hosts virtualized Windows and Linux workloads and associated storage in a mixed on-premise environment. Um, consider it a virtualization fabric for VM or Kubernetes hosting, um, software that should only be installed on approved hardware uh, and, and review of the Azure Stack HCI solution. So, we can already start to see a picture of what Microsoft are aiming to do here uh, with Azure Stack and specifically Arc is create that seamless interaction, that integration between um, the Azure Stack Hub and Edge and the core services of Azure using Arc as that single pane. Uh, I mean, Arc is a, is a software only solution that can be installed on any type of hardware, such as your own computer, Azure Stack or AWS. So, Bear in mind that you can install the Kubernetes required Azure, uh, Azure SQL Managed Instance, uh, SQL MI, and Azure Database for Postgre uh, PostgreSQL, Hyperscale, should I say, 
very important Postgres SQL hyperscale to any of these environments using Azure Arc and Arc enabled services, which is in preview. So simply installing an agent on the SQL server will allow it to manage SQL server running inside a virtual machine. Um, so later it will be simple to transfer any of these databases from your hardware to Azure. I'll say that again. The, 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 the transformation of the data to actually transfer that data, it's going to be simple. Uh, in my words, let me get my notes again. It will be simple to transfer any of these databases from your hardware to Azure. Again, from your hardware to Azure. So all of a sudden we're looking at ARC bridging the gap between data and actually bringing in databases from any other environment that ARC actually covers into Azure. So it enables you to extend Azure administration across your environments as well and use the cloud services locally and put Azure security in place wherever you like. But again, it will be simple to transfer any of these databases from your hardware to Azure. It opens up a, a whole bunch of, of possibilities, as you can imagine, uh, for using Azure Arc on, on Stack or any other platform. It's really cool stuff there. Okay, onboarding with Arc. This is a pretty cool slide. So we were just talking about moving databases uh, using the Arc infrastructure. And here, if we go from the top level down, um, I do have some notes that I'll buzz through on this. Not quite as fast firing as the last lot, and apologies if there's a huge amount of data to take on board here. We can definitely, definitely go through a bunch of questions at the end. So please get those questions ready and uh, we can we can run on. OK, let me check the chat for questions. We have questions. OK, absolutely. We will cover them off. I promise you we will. So you want to address those at the end? Um, are there any we could cover off right now, do you think? Um, just, uh, there's a couple here, uh, can a physical server with any hypervisor type be a part of Azure Arc infrastructure? Yeah, that's the best bit. So just like you'd use Azure Migrate and treat the, uh, the server running on the hypervisor as a physical machine, you can do the same with Arc. So you can poke that agent straight down to that box, regardless of the hypervisor and include it in Arc. So it, it truly is seamless in that fashion. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then we have another one here, uh, around. Uh, databases, uh, what is the key mm -hmm. architectural and operational considerations for implementing Azure Arc enabled data services such as Azure Arc enabled SQL Server and mm -hmm. post GreSQL hyperscale and how can these services be optimized to meet the specific needs of different workloads and applications? Yeah, two great, great questions. Uh, so the, 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 the last question there is, is dependent. And I know that's a horrible answer, but it's true. So let's say you have a, a SQL, we'll, we'll take straight SQL as an example, um, and you have a very straightforward deployment. Um, it's optimized, not, uh, not changed. So we haven't messed around with the scheme. It's a very uniform SQL. In that instance, I mean, let's be honest, you could take Azure Arc and push it out to any SQL server or Postgres SQL uh, or similar and have it work. If you're then looking at picking up the data and bringing it into Azure, then there are a few limitations on what you can do. If you have played around with the schema in SQL, this is non-standard, just like uh, if you were trying to migrate a database into SQL as a service within Azure, uh, you can't do that if you have made some fundamental changes on the SQL database itself in certain areas. It also means if there's been any changes made in the registry for the server uh, that it's running on, uh, it will cause complications in terms of how you lift it up and move it into as a service. It, however, does not stop you bringing up the whole box um, as a whole into Azure using the Migrate or using Azure Arc to lift the data up. Um, but there may be some caveats around how far you've changed it from the standard configurational deployment. So the truth is, if it's running on anything and it still runs, even like a, you know, a three-legged dog uh, after a hard weekend, then you're going to be able to to put this plane in front of it and view the data if it's accessible and you can get the agent onto that box and it is running any of these services you can still view that within azure arc but the migration of the data and services afterwards that's dependent on where you want to stick the data and whether you, how far up the as a service ladder you're headed and how standardized the actual database is that you're you're pulling that data from hopefully that answers the question okay let me know if it doesn't Sure, just a follow up in the questions if the, you still need some more details on that one. Um, and then yep. I see that we're gonna be covering onboarding 
Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this one's going to work within this is basically the ease of integration with the existing data center environment with Azure Arc. You'll be covering that in this area. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. okay. And then uh, let's see here. Uh, effective strategies for implementing Azure Arc enabled backup and disaster recovery solutions across mm -hmm. hybrid cloud environments. And how can these solutions be customized to meet different RTO and RPO requirements? Yeah, again, you can you can set your policies and back up the data through the agents. So using Arc as that plane to control the, the backup uh, and even DR strategies, you can assign single click policies to a bunch of servers which are diversely dispersed amongst your uh, on-premise edge and multi-cloud platforms. So it really does give you that, that ability to apply that one-click policy uh, regardless. So you can configure whichever policies you require to hit RPO, RTO, uh, and uh, apply them to whichever services that are covered within Azure Arc and have that built in, baked in as part of your uh, disaster recovery as a service almost um, in, in that instance. Again, true one-click deployment. Okay. Um, Azure R, uh, how can it be used to enable application modernization and containerization across hybrid cloud environments? And what are the key considerations for ensuring compatibility, security, and performance in these environments? Yeah, another cracking question. So, uh, you know, if, if we're saying we've got a a website you know, we've talked about SQL a lot we've got a we've got an IIS which is running on an older version on-prem we want to pull that data off using using Arc and stick it in uh, to to Azure we need to make sure that the version of IIS in Azure uh, is going to be backwards compatible to the point that we're bringing in this previous data if not we're going to have to import the data as an external data source um, and see if it will cross convert into the compatible layer or, or compatible version of IIS as an example and then you will will have uh, or you will be limited by the versions that are supported of IIS within Azure. So when we're re-architecting, there is still going to be some element. We can't just pick up a 20-year-old a database and convert it into SQL as a service <laughs> using Azure Arc. I mean, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Um, but it doesn't mean to say that we can't have that 20-year-old database still stat either on-prem or have the entire VM sh shifted into Azure. If we're talking about re-architecting that 20-year-old database into something more modern or SQL as a service, then of course it will need transforming and re-architecting. It's not something that Arc is going to do, but it will give you that that uh, that layer in front of that box to move it regardless of where it sits. So if you want to shift it from on-prem into AWS or AWS into Azure, you're able to do that and move it around. But again, you are still constrained. It doesn't necessarily mean then you can pick up something that will not run within Azure and pick it up using Arc. It doesn't get around that problem, but it does allow you to still have that presented into Azure using Arc as that plain layer. Okay. Um, and then again, with the onboarding, I'm pretty sure we're gonna handle prereqs for onboarding to Azure Arc and how is it different from cloud, other hybrid cloud solutions? Yeah, absolutely. There's even some uh, some examples which we can mail out. There's uh, uh, three simple steps to actually deploy Arc and have a play around yourself. So I've included some of those uh, bits of all the information you need actually later on in the slides. So I can make sure that all gets forwarded out to you. You can start having a play yourselves. Okay. And then uh, the hypervisor compatibility with mm -hmm. Arc infrastructure, do, do, is that, do we have that broken down as well? Um, such as forever like, changing hypervisor support. Yes, yes. Um, it, it does change at the moment. We can see in this slide we have Azure Stack HCI and VMware, uh, and then on the right side we have AWS and GCP. So at the moment, I would say VMware is is absolutely supported. If you want any other integration outside of what would be a Microsoft Hyper V and VMware, I would say for now lean on the agent and go directly to the VM itself, bypassing the hypervisor, um, treating it as a physical piece of hardware. That's that's your you work around for anything that is not currently supported. But the list does change, it will change. Um, it did change last week and change back again. So there's stuff being added in. Um, maybe not fully polished and taken away. Uh, so you'll see these things pop up in preview. If you want to get an example as to what really is coming up and what might be coming out in preview, um, go into the Azure PowerShell, list the commands, have a little list, look through the commands, find the Arc command specifically for hypervisor. And a little key tip is uh, Microsoft have to update the PowerShell commands before they push out to a single data center, even in preview. 
So a little trick I learned whilst I was at Microsoft is to have a look at the, at the code, have a look at uh, PowerShell, see what commands are available, and then you can query the bits out of those commands to see uh, what, what's actually supported. So you will see some VMware specific stuff in there and that'll give you an example of what to look for. Okay, I'm gonna hold off on these other two questions. Uh, let's get to the onboarding. Uh, and then we can follow up uh, once you're done with that, if we haven't hit that already. Great stuff. I'll pick up the pace a little bit. Um, okay. I realize there's a lot of data and it's quite geeky. Uh, so I, I hope that we haven't lost too many people already. <laughs> but we'll get that. Right. So by providing uh, uh, a unified Baltic Cloud and on-premise management platform, Azure Arc makes governance and management simpler by projecting your current on-premises and or non-Azure resources into Azure Resource Manager, Azure Arc offers a centralized unified solution to manage your whole environment collectively. If we take a look at this slide at the very top, we'll see unified operations, management and compliance, security and governance. These are all the wonderful things that we can filter down from the very top. The next level down, we have Azure Resources. So yes, we can apply those into Azure Resources, which means all of these wonderful things that sit under Azure Arc can be pulled into a resource, which is really key if we work with, if anyone who has worked with Azure knows that everything is a resource, highly important. On the left branch, Azure Arc enabled infrastructure resources. So servers, SQL servers and Kubernetes are covered and presented. On the right, we can see Azure Arc enabled services resources such as data services, app services, machine learning services as well on the right hand side. It's a distinct split. They're all reporting into the Azure Resource Manager, which in turn reports into Azure Arc. Now further down the ladder, we start on the very far left our on-premise IT infrastructure resources. We've got some servers, some SQL, some Kubernetes, that's all there. Azure Arc uh, enabled infrastructure onboarding is enabled so we can bring them through Azure Arc and present them as instances or indeed pull that data through. Second across is the on-premise Arc enabled services. So data services, app services, and machine learning. These are Azure Arc enabled services uh, deployment. So we can play around with these, we can control these uh, through Azure Arc and that single plane. Further right again, uh, also under Azure Arc enabled services deployment, we have the multi-cloud Arc enabled services, uh, which are data services, app services, machine learning services on Amazon web services and Google Cloud, Cloud Platform. I forgot to mention on the left-hand side, that's Azure Stack HCI and VMware, but also will encompass Hyper-V. I think that's an important thing that's missing out there. And the same for the multi-cloud IT infrastructure resources, albeit on Google Cloud, Cloud Platform and AWS. Again, having the Azure Arc enabled infrastructure onboarding. So you get, regardless of location, the same experience with each of these types of devices, regardless of placement. And because they're all shown through Azure Arc, you're able then to deploy the infrastructure resources, um, management compliance security and governance through one click deployment across the board and that's really important to mention that okay deploy your own as promised so phase one prerequisites uh, is consider the following basic requirements for planning your deployment your machines must run a supported operating system for the connected machine agent no, we can't just run a kind of weird mix of Ubuntu, uh, which is a decade old. There, there has to be a supported operating system installed. Your machines must have connectivity from your on-premise network or other cloud network to resources in Azure, either directly or through a proxy. And the proxy must be reasonably unlimited. There are limitations as to how much you can restrict, but again, check out uh, the, uh, the, the particulars if required. To install and configure Azure Connected Machine Agent, you must have an account with elevated privileges. That is an administrator or is root on the machines. So again, you need that LAPS uh, style or, or, or LAPS based uh, management or, or administrator management onto that box, root level. So onboard machines, you must have the Azure Connected Machine onboarding Azure built in role. That must be set. Read, modify, and delete machine, you must have the Azure Connected Machine Resource Administrator Azure built-in role. So again, get that assigned. Then phase two, your pilot. Uh, before deploying production tool machines, start by evaluating the deployment process before adopting it broadly in your environment. For a pilot, identify representative sampling of machines that aren't critical to your companies, 
please, 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 that are not critical to your company's ability to conduct business. Uh, you want to be sure enough uh, to allow enough time to run the pilot and this is in fact we recommend a minimum of 30 days. In here is establishing a formal plan, going through the objectives, the selection criteria um, for what you want to have uh, demonstrated as part of the solution, the scope, the success criteria and metrics, and a training plan. Uh, because you are learning it, you can push this on to others. The transition plan will be exactly that. It will be how you transition from pilot into production. And then most importantly, my favorite thing is a rollback. If you create a mess, you need to know how to uncreate the mess that you've created. Know the risks as well. Um, if you are playing around on a live environment, be aware of your risks. This is not risk free. So phase one, there's a detail and I'm not going to go through all of this. You can read all of this at your leisure. I'll make sure it's forwarded out, but it will go through building a foundation. In this phase, it will talk through creating a resource group, applying tags to organize the machines, to design and deploy Azure monitor logs, to develop an Azure policy governance plan, configure RBAC and identify machines with log analytics agent already installed, which is key. You don't want to push it out twice. Roughly how much it will take in terms of effort and some detail, which will help you out along the way. Phase two is deploying Azure Arc enabled servers. So in here, this is uh, going further and downloading the predefined installation scripts, creating the service principles, very important uh, part of this. Of course, it does rely on service principles, but also deploying the connected machine agent to your target servers and machines. And again, an estimated duration and some useful detail and hyperlinks. Phase three is manage and operate. Uh, so in here, this will talk you through creating a resource resource health alert, how to create an Azure advisor alert, how to assign Azure policies to your subscription or resource group scope, and how to enable update management for your Azure Arc enabled service. So as you can see here, relatively quick on this one hour, one hour varies. It does vary, of course, depending on how mad you want to go with your policies, it's going to vary 15 minutes for updating the management. So. I will make sure that makes its way out to you so you can start to have a play around with some of the fundamental basics, but perhaps we could use this time to bounce back into the questions and uh, cover off anything that you'd like to uh, talk about. Sure, I've got a couple here. Um, how cost effective is it compared to existing solutions? Cost effective. Uh, if you have an IT team that are spending a lot of time uh, on various different platforms. You've got to think about the cost effectiveness from a solutions perspective um, or from a, a personnel perspective, from a skills perspective. Um, it's all relative, isn't it? Is it cost effective? Absolutely, you're, you're bringing everything into a single pane of glass, uh, which minimizes uh, efforts in terms of looking after those resources. Uh, you know, what does it cost? Well little to nothing. It's really an investment in deployment time and design. Uh, it's only going to help uh, is the reality. It's, uh, it's hard to find the reason why this would end up costing any money outside of the deployment. It should make things a lot easier to deal with. So cost, I don't think is a major factor in this. Um, I think the benefits that it gives you in terms of offloading risk and driving your SLAs higher is, is of way more importance. Gotcha. Um, how does Microsoft's content policies apply to self-hosted data managed within Azure Arc? Self-hosted data managed. Uh, so because you have the permissions set in place uh, and you have the local administrator permission set, then those policies can be applied via the agent. So what you're doing is you're setting the preferences on those policies at an agent level, which is then being sent down to that agent to be executed locally under uh, either the service principal or, or local administrator or uh, the, the way the agent based account. So you're driving that from the very top to be run at an OS level. So how does it affect it? Well, it drives it from the OS. So if you have storage attached to that OS and you're telling it to encrypt, it's going to encrypt that separately of any hypervisor. It's going to encrypt it from the OS layer down. Now, depending on which hypervisor that's sat on, there's either going to be direct access uh, into the storage layer 
which will drive that encryption um, specifically, it's very unlikely that you're going to have a virtualized instance of the storage layer, which is not native in terms of disk access. Um, and if there is, you probably want to think about the, the security of that before trying to apply um, specific encryption policies, which may not be as effective as they could be. Okay. And then is Azure Arc open source? Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of Microsoft stuff is open source. Um, one of the things I learned when I first joined Microsoft uh, is that uh, Microsoft broke GitHub when they uploaded Windows to it all those years ago. Uh, so yeah, uh, 75 or 80% of the content on GitHub is actually belongs to Microsoft. Um, Azure Arc, there are elements of open source in there. Yes, there are elements that are not open source. And that is because there are tight regulations and control around the security for certain protocols in between Azure Arc and the agents, for example. So yeah, anything that you will find on GitHub hub for Azure Arc uh, that is open source uh, is branched, forked, updated and, and uh, reflected on a very frequent basis. So, um, so far as is the whole thing open source? No, uh, but a lot of the code is available on GitHub. Um, what are some of the key challenges and considerations for managing large scale Azure Arc deployments and how can you optimize this resource utilization and minimize your costs? Uh, don't expect it to fix a 20 year old server that sits underneath someone's desk uh, and barely works. I would say invest from a top level um, in the ideal picture first. Get get a real strong view of what you want to have from the top level down. There's no point in getting all this deployed and going, right, what do we do with it? Make sure you know exactly what it is you want to deploy and what you want to achieve. Get that picture, get that pen out, and write down what good looks like. What do you want to achieve? What problem are you trying to solve with this? Go ahead and nail that, then move on to the next. I think it would be fruitless to go ahead and just say, well, we've deployed Azure Arc because we can. Um, if you've only got a couple of bits dotted over the place and realistically, it's a waste of time. So work out what this can do for you. In a lot of cases, uh, even from the DR and data control perspective and the automatic in, uh, encryption of data or one button click encryption uh, is, is incredibly powerful. So again, I would say, what do you want to achieve? Get that sorted first and make sure that your infrastructure is in a position where it's going to handle this nicely. If it's not, get everything organized first. Be organized. You, it won't organize chaos and it won't fix that old server. So. Just be strong with what you want to achieve. And on that note of old server, uh, is 2012 OS supported for the migration? Oh, uh, you could, uh, if, if the agent will install on it, it's it's supported. Just no, because you can't move it into Azure, uh, doesn't mean it isn't yeah. supported. So yeah, you can have a real old banger. Um, and I've, I've tried with some really weird things, uh, even various different versions of, what was I trying with the last? I think it's some kind of Raspbian, um, anyway, on a bunch of old pies, uh, and it still went, yeah, I'm fine talking to those, absolutely love it. Uh, even ESC, ESP8266 um, devices <clears throat> that I've got for various door switches and alarm switches in the house, <laughs> I've connected up through Azure Arc as well. Uh, so yeah, you'd be surprised at what it works with. Um, but yeah, look on the supported list, it does change. There is more getting added in by far than there is ever really being taken away. Okay. For sure. And then uh, within Azure Arc, do we have any monitoring dashboard? Yeah. Uh, so what used to be Azure Security, which is Defender, Defender for Endpoint, yeah. Defender, all the stuff they keep changing. Yeah. If you've if you've got it connected through Azure Arc, it's going to appear in there. You can get scores on things. You can get updates. You can get uh, everything that you would from a normal Azure resource. It's going to show in those areas. So yeah. yes, that is included, and yes, you will see them there. And then uh, Azure Arc, uh, it only comes into play if they have an on-prem infrastructure? No, you don't have to have on-prem at all. Uh, if you've got stuff in AWS and, and yeah, cloud, Azure, cloud. yeah, you can have nothing in Azure and just have it deployed in AWS uh, or on Google or just Google or just a Synology NAS at home if you've got one, include it, the more the area. So this isn't limited to just one or the other, or you don't have to have everything. It's not like a, it's not like Pokemon where you have, you've got to catch them all. It can be wherever and whatever. This just gives you the single plane to manage uh, and control from within Azure. And then can we use Azure Arc to 
modernize legacy applications and infrastructure? And what's the best practice mm. that should be followed to ensure a smooth and successful migration process? To ensure smooth and successful migration process is assume it's going to break. And I know that sounds terrible, but adopt that position. Uh, Arc solves many problems, but it will not fix bad databases. It will not fix bad programming. So when you come to re-architecting an application, ask yourself a couple of questions. The first question would be, how long are you going to have this application in service for? And what is the effort of re-architecting it? If you're going to say this application is going to be in service for six months, don't bother. Slap Azure Arc on it, monitor it, keep it happy, pat it on the head and tell it everything's going to be all right, and then turn it off in six months because it's going away. If you have a longer term for this application, it's called to your business, first of all, slap yourself for not looking after the poor thing properly if it's not working particularly well, but then look at how you can integrate that and modernize it moving forwards. But know that when you re-architect an application, it may not be as simple as we spoke about with SQL as just bringing it in, using Azure Migrate uh, for, for SQL workloads. If the database has been altered, if the schema is different, if the registry on the server is different, you're going to have problems. You're looking then at exporting and importing or transforming the data into a, a more standardized environment. In fact, it has to be entirely standard if you're going to SQL as a service. So weigh up the cost of re-architecture over the cost of uh, the loss of SLA. Um, and if it makes sense to re-architect, then invest in that and get it done. What I'd say with anything is if you do have an absolute requirement to have a database with tweaks and changes and it cannot be run on SQL as a service, then run it on infrastructure, but make sure the infrastructure is well covered in terms of failover and clustering. If you can, um, if you can get rid of the reliance on, on that custom uh, requirement, if you can do so, you want to standardize, standardize everything as much as possible. But that's really more of a re-architecture position as opposed to an ARC question. So far as what you could bring up to Azure with ARC, if you wanted to bring up the whole server and snapshot it on a, on a half an hour basis, just in case of a failover, and that gives you your SLA and peace of mind and roll back an RPO, RTO of 30 minutes, then do that. It's uh, Azure is your oyster. That's a horrible saying, but <laughs> we'll coin it anyway. <laughs> and then uh, can we migrate Linux OSs? Can you migrate them? Um, if the Linux OS is supported within Azure, then yes, you can bring uh, those instances up. But again, you're not going to be able to import anything into Azure that doesn't belong. So um, if you try and bring up a VM with a, a with a, an OS that it cannot get the agent on, then mm -hmm. it's not going to allow it to run rogue. And, and there are real strong reasons for that. Security aside, there are strong SLA governance reasons why that can't happen. So it's not to say you can't have a virtualization instance running in microservices on Kubernetes to import that really bizarre flavor of Linux into. Maybe that's a good option. Uh, and then uh, what are two major arcs? What, what are the two major arcs? The two major? Arcs. Arcs. The two major arcs. In what way? Yeah, if we can get a little bit more clarification on that. While I'm waiting on that, let's jump to the next one. Is uh, okay. How do we create an Azure arc? How do you create it? Uh, follow the lovely little guide, which um, I'm sure that we'll be sending out to you guys. So it really is a simple, uh, you already have the control uh, interface uh, that you use if you're using Azure daily. It's then just a case of getting the connectivity between what you'd like to ha be, have presented within Azure Arc and reaching out and adding it in. So again, our back, uh, getting the right roles in place, getting the right administrative um, capabilities and permissions in place and simply onboarding it. So really straightforward. It's, it's very powerful and very simple to do. Okay. And then uh, we've got here uh, PowerShell. Is it support for PowerShell SDK? You know, can we automate via PowerShell in R? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So anything that you can do with Azure, in terms of the REST API interface or PowerShell, if you can command against a resource group or a specific set of code against a resource group or instance, you can do exactly the same using Arc. So you can call upon that instance, which in fact is, 
uh, a resource deployed on-prem or somewhere else because you're talking to the OS through that uh, agent it gives you the direct feed into what is something very similar to uh, an Azure agent what you lose is the ability on the hypervisor uh, for example VMware to do various things that you could potentially do within Azure such as changing um, disk layout parameters IOPS and all the stuff you know that you just wouldn't have control over because it doesn't exist in that Hyper-V uh, sorry in that uh, VMware infrastructure from the hypervisor standpoint but everything else yeah if you want to call uh, through your if you have a bunch of scripts that run PowerShell that you want to command through Arc to do something on-prem or in another cloud yes so it's a very long way of saying yes the answer to your question is yes all right so let's uh real quick while we wait and see if there's anything else that pops up I got some housekeeping to do um cool. so we got the gift card giveaway uh, so be on the lookout for notification on that afterwards. Uh, work has no boundaries. Just a reminder down there at the QR code. Uh, if you scan that, it'll take you to the web page. And that leads to one of the other last remaining questions we have was, can we get a demo? Sure thing. Um, just go ahead and follow through. We'll also be following up afterwards. If you guys want to get some more information, we'll definitely be able to provide a demo. That's no problem whatsoever. Um, Johnny will definitely be able to help us out with that and the folks at Incentra. So we can for sure hook that up for you, no problem whatsoever. Um, and then with that, Johnny, I want to thank you for being here today. Incentra is always a very close partner of ours. Um, I do want to point out down the bottom of this slide um, is a QR code that goes to our YouTube page, which is where we will be posting the recording for this once it gets completed. Uh, and uploaded there. So definitely you can go to the uh, YouTube page, view this webinar or any other previous webinars that we have going. But uh, again, going back to that demo follow up with us, we'll definitely make sure that you get one. And thank you again, everybody for attending another Partner Spotlight on Wednesday. Uh, it's been great, Johnny. Phenomenal information. I really appreciate it. The detail has been awesome. Um, so we it's look forward to talking to you in the future, as well as uh, some other customers. Great to speak to you. Thank you, John. And thanks to all the joins as well. Really appreciate it. All right. See everybody later.